Takati, Anthony, David, and Elizabeth. To all the friends and admirers of Richard who come together to celebrate an extraordinary life. In 1999, at the height of the crisis in Kosovo, Richard gave an interview in which he addressed the question of why the United States was engaged in bringing peace to that war-torn corner of the world. Why bother? His answer was simple. Because we could make a difference. Because we could make a difference. That is the story of American leadership in the world. And that is also the story of Richard Holbrook. He made a difference. In 1962, when he was just 22 years old, he set out for Vietnam as a Foreign Service officer. He could not have known the twists and turns that lay ahead of him and his country in that war, or the road that he would travel over nearly five decades of service to his country. But it's no coincidence that his life story so closely paralleled the major events of his times. The list of places he served, the things he did, reads as a chronicle of American foreign policy. Speaking truth to power from the Mekong Delta to the Paris peace talks. Paving the way to our normalization of relations with China. Serving as ambassador in a newly unified Germany. Bringing peace to the Balkans. Strengthening our relationship with the United Nations and working to advance peace and progress in Afghanistan and Pakistan. Richard came of an age looking up to the men who had helped shape the post-war world. Dean Acheson, Avril Harriman, Clark Kiffer, Dean Rusk. And in many ways, he was the leading light of a generation of American diplomats who came of age in Vietnam. It was a generation that came to know both the tragic limits and awesome possibilities of American power. Born at a time of triumph in World War II, steeped in the painful lessons of Southeast Asia, participants in the twilight struggle that led ultimately to freedom, freedom's triumph during the Cold War. After the shadow of communism lifted along with the Iron Curtain, Richard understood that America could not retreat from the world. He recognized that our prosperity is tied to that of others, that our security is endangered by instability abroad, and most importantly, that our moral leadership is at stake when innocent men Women and children are slaughtered through senseless violence, whether it's in Srebrenica or Islamabad. Richard possessed a hard-headed, clear-eyed realism about how the world works. He was not, not naive. But he also believed that America has a unique responsibility in the course of human events. He understood American power in all its complexity and believed that when it is applied with purpose and principle, it can tip the scales of history. And that coupling of realism and idealism, which has always represented what is best in American foreign policy, that was at the heart of his work in Bosnia 
where he negotiated and cajoled and threatened all at once until peace was the only outcome possible. And by the time I came to know Richard, his place in history was assured. His options in the private sector, where so many of his peers had settled, were too numerous to mention. But from my first conversation with him in Chicago, in my transition office, a conversation in which he teared up when he began to talk about the importance of restoring America's place in the world. It was clear that Richard was not comfortable on the sidelines. He belonged in the arena. To Kati and to his wonderful family, I am personally grateful. I know that every hour he spent with me in the Situation Room or spent traveling to Southeast Asia, South Asia, was time spent away from you. You shared in his sacrifice, and that sacrifice is made greater because he loved you so. He served his country until his final moments. Those who take the measure of his last mission will see his foresight. He understood that the futures of Afghanistan and Pakistan are tied together. In Afghanistan, he cultivated areas like agriculture and governance to seed stability. With Pakistan, he created new habits of cooperation to overcome decades of mistrust. And globally, he helped align the approaches of 49 nations were you here with us, I know Richard would credit the extraordinary team that he assembled. And today I'd like to make a personal appeal to the SRAP team, particularly the young people. Stay in public service. Serve your country. Seek the peace that your mentor so ardently sought. I also know that Richard would want us to lift up the next generation of public servants, particularly our diplomats, who so rarely receive credit. And so I'm proud to announce the creation of an annual Richard C. Holbrook Award to honor excellence in American diplomacy. As we look to the next generation, it is fitting, as David mentioned, that this memorial take place at the Kennedy Center, named for the President who called Richard's generation to serve. It's also fitting that this memorial takes place at a time when our nation has recently received a tragic reminder that we must never take our public servants for granted. We must, must always honor their work. America is not defined by ethnicity. It's not defined by geography. We are a nation born of an idea, a commitment to human freedom. And over the last five decades, there have been countless times when people made the mistake of counting on America's decline or disengagement. Time and again, those voices have been proven wrong, but only because of the service and sacrifice of exceptional men and women, those who answered the call of history and made America's cause their own. Like the country he served, Richard con contained complexities. So full of life, he was a man both confident in himself and curious about others, alive to the world around him with a character that is captured in the words of a Matthew Arnold poem that he admired. But often, in the din of strife, there rises an unspeakable desire. After the knowledge of the buried life, the thirst to spend our fire and restless force in tracking our true original course, 
a longing to inquire into the mystery of this heart which beats so wild, so deep in us, to know whence our lives come and where they go. Richard is gone now, but we carry with, his, with us his thirst to know, to grasp, and to heal the world around him. His legacy is seen in the children of Bosnia who live to raise families of their own, in a Europe that is peaceful and united and free, in young boys and girls from the tribal regions of Pakistan to whom he pledged our country's friendship, and in the role that America continues to play as a light to all who aspire to live in freedom and in dignity. Five decades after a young president called him to serve, we can confidently say that Richard bore the burden to assure the survival and success of liberty. He made a difference. Let us now carry that work forward in our time. May God bless the memory of Richard Holbrook, and may God bless the United States of America. I know this program has been somewhat lengthy, but honestly, it takes this many talkers to do Holbrook justice, to keep up with Holbrook. I mean, he hasn't said a word here, and I think we're still behind. <laughs> I will say uh, that uh, Hillary and I were asked to end the program, and we are appearing according to Holbrook protocol. The one with the real power speaks last. <laughs> Mr. President, uh, Kati, to all of you, my real relationship with Richard began almost 20 years ago when Sandy Berger got Dick and I together one night for a drink so that he could interview me to determine whether I could suitably run for the Democratic nomination for president. And somehow or another, I passed the test. By the end of the night, he was so aggressive, I thought he was going to finish with his hands on my throat. <laughs> but I like that. A lot of people haven't talked about this tonight, but if you were in a professional relationship with Holbrook, as I was, as well as being friendly, there basically were three kinds of meetings you could have with other people looking. There were the meetings where you were arguing about policy. <laughs> Those are the ones where he made all the enemies, the people who didn't get to talk here tonight, this afternoon, where he would scream and claw and scratch and make you feel like you had a double-digit IQ if you didn't agree with him. <laughs> but. He did that because he knew the purpose of diplomacy was to end wars or avoid them or minimize conflict or save lives. It's worth ruffling a few feathers for diplomacy to save lives. Then there were the meetings where a policy had been adopted and he didn't exactly agree with all of it, but there it was and he either had to leave or wave the flag. Oh, he was good at that. You would have thought it, were all, it was his idea. Then there were the policies that he was charged with implementing that he deeply agreed with. Then he was a hurricane of eloquence and energy and force. He was a great diplomat because he was smart and he could learn and he could think, he could write, he could speak. And most importantly, he could do. He never was in a meeting in his life when he wasn't thinking about, okay, what are we going to do? And he loved the doers. One of the saddest days of my presidency was August 19, 1995, when we had begun the negotiations to end the Bosnian War or at least to end the siege of Srebrenica. 
and the shelling in Sarajevo. And uh, Dick called me with Wes Clark to tell me that they'd had a terrible accident on Mount Igman Road. We'd lost a vehicle, and Bob Fraser, Joe Krusel, and Nelson Drew had all been killed. Three of the best public servants he'd ever worked with, part of our team. Because Milosevic would not let them fly, knowing the roads were unsafe. So we had a memorial service. We tried to promise to remember them. I still have three Christmas ornaments that Hillary and I put on our tree every year for those three men. But Holbrook was determined to honor them by ending the violence. By the end of August, the siege had been lifted. The talks began at Dayton in November. Three weeks later, we had an agreement. And you can do in matters big and small now. Some people will say that President Obama and Hillary gave him a much harder job working in Afghanistan and Pakistan. I agree with that. But I gave him a harder one still. I made him the United States ambassador to the United Nations when Kofi was Secretary General and he had to talk Jesse Helms into paying our UN dues. And he did that too. How in the living daylights he got Jesse Helms to do that, I'll never know. <laughs> but he did. There's a lot to laugh about, a lot to be grateful for. After I left the White House, I learned that Holbrook's unerring sense of protocol had shifted again and he realized he no longer worked for me, and maybe on occasion I would work for him. <laughs> and the one thing he was no good at, there was only one thing he was no good at. He would overdo all this flattery when you knew he basically didn't mean a word of it. <laughs> so I, I remember two things in particular. He would, he'd call me one time, and he wanted me to give a speech to the Asia Society. And he kept saying what a great thing it would be for them, and what he was really also saying was, you know, you ought to do this. You need to keep your hand in the game, otherwise people will think you don't know anything anymore. <laughs> so when I said I would do it, he proceeded to tell me exactly what I should talk about and how I should say it. <laughs> and then he headed this business group, you know, to fight AIDS around the world, which was a really noble thing. And when we started, there was nowhere near as much money going into it as there was, is now. And we still had then, we still have now, about 80% of the people in the world who are HIV positive who didn't know their status. Within a month, I'd been working on this for years, within a month, Holbrook knew as much about all this stuff as I did. And he relentlessly, relentlessly drove this agenda. And he got me to appear at all these things, always saying this group or that business person or the other would help me, but it was always, Basically, I work for you, I did all this stuff, now you work for me, go do this. So I did it. <laughs> I love the guy. Because he could do. Doing and diplomacy saves lives. Everything everybody said about him here is true. But in the end, what matters is there are a lot of people walking around on the face of the earth today, or their children, or their grandchildren, because of the way he lived his life. And I never did understand how people would let the little rough edges, which to me was so obvious what he was doing, it was so obvious why he felt the way he did. I could never understand people who didn't appreciate them. Most of the people who didn't were not nearly as good at doing. Sometime in my second term, Kati and Dick started hosting a holiday dinner in the season in Hillary's honor. And they'd asked me to come, which made me know I was a, kind of a lame duck. 
And uh, once Holbrook and I were talking about all the stuff we'd done together and all the stuff that had happened since that first night when we were having a drink and he was interviewing me for my suitability to become president. And it was after Hillary was at least running for the Senate. I don't know whether she'd been elected or not, but he looked at me and he said, you know, she's better than you are. <laughs> and I said, uh, yeah, I knew that before you did. <laughs> and I said, I know one other thing. You're still my ambassador and you have to keep that a secret for one more year. If you knew him, you had to love him. And if you understand that the business of diplomacy is saving lives, you have to appreciate every single stratagem he deployed to try to do it, including when he said or did things that exhausted the rest of us. The great thing about him was even when he lost his last battle, he was fighting, and the fight kept him forever young. And for that, I will be forever grateful. Well, I am last because my office is on the seventh floor, which is as close to heaven as you can get. So I end the program by being and bringing you with me to be as close to Richard as we can be. I'm very, very moved by the outpouring of love and admiration and respect that has been sent to me on behalf of our country from so many places across the world. And in this audience this afternoon are so many who have worked with Richard in the past and were working with him today. If we had time, each and every one of you would have your own stories. I want to start with Richard on an airplane. Those of us who flew with Richard never forgot the experience. Imagine being confined in a small space for many hours with Richard determined to make his point and convince you to agree with it. It was a combination of a big personality and a small space that led everyone who traveled with him to be able to say at the end of our flight, I too now have a story about Richard Holbrook. Richard would begin by assessing every seat to find the one he deemed most comfortable. And then he would use every one of his diplomatic skills to persuade the person who had the seat to give it up to him. He would roam the cabin, insert himself into conversations, tell stories, and provoke arguments. Sometimes those arguments snowballed. On one flight years ago, when Richard was a younger diplomat, he and a staffer from the White House ended up in a mutual headlock over who got to see transcripts of a conversation with Deng Xiaoping. That presaged the kind of headlock experiences Richard would have with White Houses through the years. And so even more people had their story. But what was most memorable is that on many flights, he would disappear into the restroom and then emerge, having changed out of his sober business suit into what he called his sleeping suit. <laughs> it was bright yellow. He would brief the press in it. 
And the rest of us would shrug and say, that's Richard being Richard. There simply was no one like him anywhere else in the world. For 20 years, I had a front row seat to Richard being Richard. He was my trusted colleague. Occasionally, he was my biggest headache. Often, he was an inspiration, and always, he was my friend. And Richard was a genius at friendship. As Bill has said, we were so delighted to attend annual holiday parties that Richard and Kati would throw. And apparently, one year, some months before, I had said something complimentary about the work done by the Salvation Army. It was a completely offhand comment. Anyone else would have forgotten it, not Richard. So in the middle of dinner, he gave a signal, the doors swung open, and in marched the Salvation Army Band. <laughs> Trumpets blaring, carols being sung, and Richard beaming from ear to ear, once again, Richard being Richard. Richard was brilliant, blunt, and he did fight until the final bell for what he believed in. Now, Richard, upon hearing Winston Churchill's famous motto, never, 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 never give up, said that Churchill was half-hearted. <laughs> there are many of us in this audience who've had the experience of Richard calling 10 times a day if he had to say something urgent. And of course, he believed everything he had to say was urgent. And if he couldn't reach you, he would call your staff. He'd wait outside your office. He'd walk into meetings to which he was not invited, act like he was meant to be there, and just start talking. I personally received the Richard Holbrook treatment many times. He would give me homework. He would declare that I had to take one more meeting, make one more stop. There was no escaping him. He would follow me onto a stage as I was about to give a speech, or into my hotel room, or on at least one occasion, into a ladies' room. <laughs> in Pakistan. <laughs> when he had an idea, he would pitch it to me. If I said no, Richard, no. He would wait a few days, and then he would try again. Finally, I would say, Richard, I've said no. Why do you keep asking me? And he would look at me so innocently, and he would reply, I just assumed at some point you would recognize that you were wrong and I was right. <laughs> and you know, sometimes that did happen. Richard and I were a team. Starting in Bosnia when I was first lady through his years at the UN, his work on AIDS and global health, and our work together on Afghanistan and Pakistan. It was not always being easy on Richard's team. We went through a lot of tough times in those years, but we went through them together. He stood by me through my battles, and I stood by him through his. So I feel his absence keenly, and I know so many people here do as well. This is a loss personally, and it is a loss for our country. We face huge tasks ahead of us, and it would be better if Richard were here driving us all crazy about what we needed to be doing. 
He had, as we've heard from others, secured his place in history. I am confident that the work he had done and was doing in Afghanistan and Pakistan will also stand the test of time. And I greatly appreciate President Zardari coming all the way to be with us today. He was... <laughs> he was, as Mike Mullen said, passionate about restoring the balance between our military and civilian operations. He was determined to bring that balance back through sheer force of will, if necessary. Shortly after Richard was named to be the special envoy for Afghanistan and Pakistan, I decided that I needed to bring Richard and General Petraeus together. So I invited them both over to our home here in Washington. And I set up two chairs with a third, and I just watched them interact. And those are two men with a lot of energy. I was exhausted by the time they had finished going through everything that they were thinking and what needed to be done in the years ahead. And as they were leaving, they both said, let's do this again tomorrow night. <laughs> but Richard got results. The High Peace Council that he helped launch in Afghanistan is working and just sent a delegation to Pakistan. His work on water, energy, agriculture, and trade is paying off in significant improvements to people's lives. He had a vision where we needed to be going, and despite all the challenges, which he knew very well, he remained optimistic and positive about what we could do together. Richard did this work with the help of a phenomenal team that he assembled with great gusto and pride over the past two years. They represent some of the best minds and biggest talents from inside and outside government, and many of them are here today. So let me say to Richard's team, you meant the world to Richard, and all of us at the State Department are proud of your work. He also created an international contact group with now more than 40 countries represented and increasing numbers of Muslim-majority countries as part of that international contact group. I met with some of them who traveled so far to come here for this celebration of Richard's life. And you, too, meant a great deal to Richard because he saw that we must have a political solution and that we must work to build regional and international support. Many of Richard's staffers are young, but then he was young when he started, and he wanted to give young people a chance to learn and serve and work on behalf of the country that he felt such a commitment to. There are few people in any time, but certainly in our time, who can say, I stopped a war, I made peace, I saved lives, I helped countries heal. Richard Holbrook did these things. He believed that great men and women could change history. And he did. He wanted to be a great man so he could change history. He was and he did. His time with us ended far too soon. And yet, he lived enough for 10 lives. So while we mourn, we have reason for joy. Joy for the life that Richard lived, joy that we were able to be part of it, that we went along for the ride. 
and his partners in that endeavor were his family, his sons, David and Anthony, and their families, Lizzie and Chris, his grandchildren, and most of all, Kati, a friend to us all, and someone who understood and loved Richard so well. The family they built together casts light on so many people. There is a book of early Jewish wisdom, the book of Ben Sirah, which includes this passage. With three things I am delighted, for they are pleasing to the Lord and to men. Harmony among brethren, friendship among neighbors, and the mutual love of husband and wife. With his life and legacy, Richard Holbrook was three for three. God bless you, my friend. Thank you.